Hello Engineering YouTubers and welcome to the second video this week for Eng 1001. In the first video we gave you some fundamental definitions for angular displacement, angular velocity and angular acceleration. And we're going to be using each one of those definitions. So if you're not quite sure about them, go over that video again. In this video, we're going to be defining radial acceleration. We'll find out why you need to have a radial acceleration in order to cause rotation. Now again this week, we're mainly going to be looking at something called particle rotation. And indeed, in the next video, we'll look specifically at that question. However, what we're learning about uh, is useful both for particle rotation and also for what's known as a rigid body rotation. Now, what happens when we rotate an object? We are constantly changing direction. Uh, and because we're constantly changing direction, we know that velocity is a vector. That means that we must be changing our velocity, at least the direction of that velocity vector. Uh, and so for that, we need to have an acceleration because an acceleration is a change in velocity. And that acceleration that we have is a radial acceleration. So what we're going to do here is we're going to define where does a radial acceleration come from. Uh, we won't need you to be able to define it from first principles, say, under exam conditions. But for many of you, you just want to know where does it come from. So let's have a look at that. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at a point mass. So we can imagine that uh, any one of these cars on this roller coaster is a point mass. I've got one of the cars just here. It's got a velocity going about. Uh, and we're going to say it's got a constant angular velocity, which means that the magnitude of the velocity this vector length here is going to be the same. But you see that the direction varies from one position to the next position. So as this car moves from here to here, even if it's going at a constant magnitude of velocity, it, the direction of the velocity is going to change. And as it moves along, it's changing a particular angle. So some small angle, because we're looking at just a small amount of time. Uh, for my coordinate system, well, I've got my coordinate system there, and we're going to be looking at some vector calculus. Okay, so we can write out our equations for the velocity at two instances in time. So let's have a look at that. The equations may be written as, well, here, my initial velocity here, we can see that the only component of velocity that I have is in this j direction. So I've got it there, there's the j component. And from the previous video, we saw that our velocity is equal to the radius multiplied by the angular velocity. And in the second position, I've got my position just there. I'd like to think about what the velocity is here and how I'd actually define that mathematically. Let's do that. Uh, I've got a component of velocity in the j direction. It's the vertical direction. And I've got a component of velocity in now in the i direction, going this way. And these two components, they give me my actual velocity that I'm measuring. Uh, and notice that I'm being very careful here to actually put the direction of my velocity in there as well as the magnitude. So there's the direction of my velocity and it's the same just there. Now you know from your trigonometry that this angle here is, well we've called it the theta just there, so a little tiny angle, we'll call it the theta just there as well. Uh, and we're going to use that to be able to work out each one of our terms. So in the j direction, so that's this component of the velocity, the velocity now is r omega, which is what it was before, so it hasn't changed its magnitude there except that it's now multiplied by cos d theta. And now I've got this additional component of velocity just here. Notice that it's going in this direction here. So it's going that way, a little tiny bit of velocity going that way. That's the negative direction. So I've got a minus sign just here. It's r omega sine d theta. So I'm using my trigonometry to be able to get the components and the magnitudes for each of those two components. Okay, so I have my definition of my two velocities here. And we know that an acceleration is defined as a change in velocity as a function of time. So we had to work out that change in velocity. And I'm going to do that just by subtracting one velocity from the other. So my change in velocity is just the final velocity minus the initial velocity. And we can see that's just all I've written out here. So I'm using a vector subtraction here. I've got uh, my i term, there's no i term in the v1 term, so I'm just taking that v2 uh, component just there. I've also now got uh, v2 for the j component minus the v1 component just there. Okay, so that there is my uh, change in velocity, little tiny change in velocity. We've got our little tiny change in angle as well. Still looks pretty complicated. I'm wondering if I can simplify that in some way. 
So I've rewritten it here and in fact we can. We know that we were only taking a snapshot with a small angle. So our car that we were looking at, it started off here and this we can imagine just to be a very, very small angle just here between the two positions that I'm actually taking the measurement at. So looking at that, get out your calculator, have a look. If you've got sine of a very small angle, then it's approximated very, very well by that small angle. And cos of a small angle is approximated very, very well by 1. So what I can do is I can take my sine times a small angle and I can just replace it with a small angle. I can take my cos of a small angle and just let all of that there equal to 1. Have a look what's going to happen. I've got 1 minus 1 there, so all of this term is going to go away. And if you wanted that written a little bit more neatly, there it is at the bottom of the slide. We can see that uh, this here is my definition now for my change in velocity. Well, we know a change in velocity is uh, not quite enough for the acceleration. We need a change in velocity as a change in time. And we have just here now our change in angle as a function of change in time. We notice that that there is our definition of an angular velocity. And so what we have just here is that is an angular velocity multiplied by an angular velocity. So it's the angular velocity squared. And look at the direction that this is occurring in. That the direction is towards the center of rotation. So an radial acceleration always acts towards the center of rotation and it's proportional to the angular velocity squared. So that there is our definition for the radial component of acceleration. And you need a radial component of acceleration in order to be able to change the direction of the velocity. Uh, and that then allows us to be able to have a rotational motion. So if we have a look at, say, an aircraft that uh, is doing a stunt of some description, it's always towards the center of rotation. So the radial acceleration always towards the center of rotation. And we have for our radial acceleration, we've got our magnitude as well. So what you saw in the last few slides was a development of why you have a radial acceleration and the direction which it points in, why it's pointing in that direction. You don't need to be able to derive that. You need to be able to use this knowledge though to be able to solve problems. So in order to be able to have an acceleration in the radial direction, then we need to have some kind of force also in the radial direction in order to be able to give us that acceleration term. And so I'm using uh, F equals MA here. It's uh, a Newton's second law. And we can have a look at a couple of different examples, three examples here. What's giving us our particular force that allows for a radial component of acceleration. Well, if we start with the person on the swing, the radial component of acceleration is given to us by the tension in the chain uh, of, uh, of this swing just here. For the satellite, it's the gravity of the Earth that's giving us the radial component of acceleration. And for the roller coaster, it's the normal force given to the cars by the track which is giving us again our radial component of acceleration. So just as a quick summary, we've got our radial component of acceleration. There it is. We've got a tangential component of acceleration. There's that as well. Notice that they're normal to each other. So the tangential component of acceleration is in the direction of motion. The radial component of acceleration is always towards the center. There's a 90 degrees between the two. And so if we want the total acceleration, we can work that out just by squaring each of those terms, take the square root, and you've got the total acceleration acting on any one of these little objects here when they're rotating.